us. We began a new series as we um, entering the Christmas season. Um, last week, Pastor Jeremy kicked us off, and I would highly recommend that you go and listen to it if you haven't yet, called The Effect of His Coming. The Effect of of his coming and my job this morning is to look into a couple of the effects that he has um that he has given us some of the effects that have just exist because he turned up we're going to dive right into the scripture matthew chapter 3 verse 1 it says in those days john the baptist came preaching in the wilderness of judea and saying repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord and make straight paths for him. Now John's clothes were made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey and people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming out to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God could raise up children for Abraham. But the axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Lord, I'm just going to pray again. Lord, I'm so grateful for your words. Lord, I'm so thankful for your words. What a blessing it is, your life-giving, your soul-inspiring, your rock-solid words. It brings us peace when our minds are anxious. It brings us warmth when our faith grows cold. It has brought me grace and mercy when my shame has kept us apart. It has brought me joy when my heart was broken. It has brought me life when my bones were dry. It has set me free with truth when deceit has kept me bound. It has brought me light to my path when the darkness closed me in. It has delivered me from evil, led me away from temptation. Lord, bless us today, we pray with that word. Let it be a sword through the plans of our enemy. Open our hearts, our minds, and our ears and our eyes to receive what your spirit would say to your church. Amen. Amen, amen. The effects of his coming. The Gospel of Luke tells us a story about Jesus in chapter 14. He was invited to go and eat with some of the prominent leaders um, of the church, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He, He went to eat dinner at their house. And it's fascinating how perceptive Jesus always was. Always watching, always listening. No matter what, you know, he, was, he always had an objective. He always had a mission. He always had something that the Father was asking him to do. That somewhere where the Spirit was leading him, yet he was always taking note of those around him in ca- case he found someone in need. You know, for 30 years of his life, we know very little about him. And I wonder sometimes if he had so much wisdom because he spent those years silent or even asking questions. We know when he was a 12-year-old boy, they were astounded at his wisdom. They were astounded at the questions that he asked, getting the sense, seeing what was out there, perceiving what is happening. And so he's eating dinner at this house and he's watching these people. Now, they are carefully watching him trying to trip him up as well. They're watching him, their eyes are on him, and yet his eyes are on them. And he sees that people are coming and they're fighting, they're, they're fighting to take the, the highest place. You know, they, they want to sit at the head of the table, the, the head of the table where it's more prominent, where you are honoured. And guess these guests to someone's house were fighting, it seems ludicrous to us. And he says, you know, it's probably a good idea when you're invited to someone's house, why don't you go and sit at the foot of the table? That way, if the host, if the host wants you to sit further up the table, he's going to ask you to come and sit further up the table. However, if you go and sit out the head, he's going to bring you down. One way you're going to be exalted, the other way you're going to be humiliated. It just seems like common sense. 
And no wonder these people hated him so much because they're watching him trying to trip him up because they think he doesn't know and understand the rules of the game. But the fact is, Jesus wasn't even playing their game. He was so far ahead of him. And one of the effects of his coming, I was going to say this morning, I was going to label this message, the effect of his coming was to level the playing field. And it is something that he did, leveled the playing field. You know, we see prominent people. We see, well, you know, Abraham had a lot of money, Isaac, Jacob, some of the patriarchs. And, and God used some of these people. When Jesus came along and he found these fishermen that weren't educated, he completely leveled the playing field. And then I realized, no, Jesus didn't just level the playing field. He changed the game completely. He changed the game completely. He flipped it on its head. It's so no wonder they were frustrated at him because while they're playing checkers, he's playing chess and he's saying, look, there is some deep wisdom, some deep theological insight, understanding of the spirit in this teaching. Sit at the foot of the table. But it just makes common sense. Maybe he's just saying, you know, even if you had a brain and didn't believe in God, you would sit at the foot of the table because it's better to be exalted than it is to be humiliated. You end up in the same place either way. One is good, one is bad. And this was the game that Jesus was playing. They were so frustrated with him because he smashed their expectations. Not only did he change the game, he has rigged the game. You see, he has defeated sin and death. He has doomed the devil and his team. He has rewritten the script. And the game that he is playing, he has already won. The devil is done. Jesus came to be a light for us so we could see what we're doing. He gave us his word that we would have his knowledge. And he's empowered us with the Holy Spirit to give us the energy to see this game through. And the truth is that we win, folks, if we hold on to the very end. Jesus changed the game. The effect of his coming. Pastor Jeremy said last week, Jesus affects everything he touches. He opened eyes that couldn't see, ears that were blocked, mouths that couldn't speak. He could touch people with the most contagious diseases and he wouldn't catch what they had. They would catch what he had. He would set them free, cast out devils. This is who Jesus was. And if there are some of us in this room thinking I'm still bound by something, let me say that who the sun sets free is free indeed. Jesus wants to touch and have an encounter with you and don't leave this place until he does because he changes things. When he touches them. (laughs) Flipping expectations. Turn everything on its head. No wonder the people weren't ready for him. They thought someone else was coming. Waiting for a king, a politician, a warrior, a fighter, a soldier, whatever it is. He flipped it around. Expectations. Everything he touched, he changed. He touched some cords. He turned them into whips. Went into his father's house, we heard last week. Flipped over tables. He flipped everything. Desires, aspirations. When he wasn't born in the palace, he was born in a manger. He wasn't surrounded by kings or queens. He was surrounded by animals. He didn't grow up as a baby and playing in the playground. He grew up with a bounty on his head. He didn't attend Ivy League. He would become a humble carpenter. He didn't come seeking revenge, but he poured out mercy and forgiveness. He didn't demand to be served. He sought people he could serve. He would not strive to gain, to obtain or receive, but he would, he would give. He received no honorable ordination, but 40 days of fasting and temptation. When he was refused a pulpit, he went and found a boat. And when the wealthy left him, he would, be, he would welcome in the poor. He didn't build an army, but fishes of men. And while our royals are mourned and blessed by billions on telecast, telecast funeral around the world... He was rejected and despised and hung on a cursed tree to die. No wonder they missed the Messiah. Jesus changed the game completely, but the good, it is good news for us. The effect of his coming was greater than our ability to comprehend. He had a greater impact than we'll ever know this side of heaven, at least. Our perspective of, perspective of time is based on his coming, splitting it in half. But the thing is, we have often been taught that Jesus exists, God exists, God is in our lives so that we can add him to our lives so that we could, um, so that he could do things for us. This is where these religious leaders were and crazy John the Baptist is out there and he might have been a little bit crazy, but he didn't lack courage and was able to say it to them. 
You're expecting God to do everything for you. John the Baptist, no, he was a herald. He was sent to prepare the way of the Lord. And he said, Jesus said, no one was greater, uh, was born, who was born from woman was greater than this man, than John the Baptist. High thoughts, high expectations, high praise from Jesus about John the Baptist. That was his job, the voice of one crying in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. And Pastor Jeremy touched on it last week, what these people would do when the king was coming into town, they would go and fix the roads, and if there were hills, they would knock them down. If there were valleys, they would fill them in. The potholes filled in, they would make everything smooth. This is what they were to do, those who were preparing the way for the Lord. And we think God is in our life so that he can move mountains for us. No, God is saying, I want to use my people to move mountains to prepare the way for me. We've been learning Thursday night, we're learning about um, evangelism. Josh is, uh, is, is, he's, he's on fire at the moment, it's exciting. The food truck is ready to go. We're talking about what are, what are we going to do next year because we want, we want to represent Jesus well. We want to be a bridge to our community and not a barrier. We want to make sure that we represent Jesus for who he is. Do you understand the weight that sits on your shoulders? That is our job. Because Jesus came as a baby the first time. He's coming as a king when he comes again. It is our job to prepare the way for the risen Lord. That's the expectation that sits on our shoulders. He changed the game. A few things. He changed the game through the gift of repentance. It began, Matthew 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Did you know that repentance is a gift? It's a gift. You know, we hear about it lots in the church. And if you've been in church a lot of your life, you've probably heard about it all the time. And to be honest, when this was coming to me and I felt like God wanted me to share this message, I thought, God, this is going to bore people straight away. Everyone's heard about repentance. Repent for the... You know, it reminds me of... I remember seeing a guy guy in the mall with no hair and, and a scraggly beard standing on a box saying, Repent. The kingdom of heaven is near, and I thought about this, and I, but the problem is, we, half the time we don't understand what it truly means. Because repent, if you want to put up that next slide, repent was the first word, <coughs> sorry, the next one there, was the first word of John the Baptist's gospel. It was also the first word of Jesus' gospel, to repent. Repent was the first word in the preaching ministry of the 12 disciples, It was the first word, the preaching instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples after his resurrection. And repent was the first word of exhortation in the first Christian sermon by Peter. Repent was the first word in the mouth of the apostle Paul through his ministry. He talks about it there in Acts 26. He's referring back to when I started preaching. This was the message. This is the gospel message to repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. It's not talking about be saved, to add Jesus to your life, to see what he can do in your life. It's repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's to understand when Jesus came, he came and flipped everything upside down. He changed the game completely. And it no longer matters who you are. It doesn't matter how much money you have or where you've come from, who your parents are. You can start again today. Repentance is a change of mind, something so simple, yet it is so hard to get. It is so hard to apply. It is so hard that most of us don't really live where we should be living. We don't repent how we should repent because it has to be more than just a change of mind. Metanoia, that's the Greek word for repentance. It simply means a change of mind. That's what repent means. It is not a chore. It is not a burden. It is not a punishment. It is a blessing that we get to repent. And it gets to be so easy for us to change our minds and our ways. You know, because most of the time we prefer to hang on to shame because we feel like we need to punish ourselves for the sin and the guilt. We, need, we can't get away that easy. Something so simple can't be so free. It can't be so easy to repent, to change. It can't be that easy. Joel, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't understand. There must be something I need to do. And Jesus said, I did it all at the cross. I paid for it all. I paid for your sins. I paid for your mistakes. Guess what? Today you get to wipe that slate clean because this is the effects of Jesus coming. That repentance could be so simple and yet so difficult. Not everything that is simple is easy. Anyone ever tried to lose weight? <laughs> the simplest thing in the world, a little bit of addition and subtraction, 
burn more calories than you take. It's that simple, yet it is so hard. Breaking addictions. Just stop eating. (laughs) Just don't take that other bottle. Just don't look at porn. So simple. You just you don't need to sleep with him, you know? It's easy to break addictions. Sorry, it's simple to break addictions, but it's not easy. It's the same with repentance, and we see this beautifully in the story of Judas. And again, repentance, it's, you know, it's got nothing to do with your emotions, that you don't need to walk down the road of shame and guilt and punish and strap and slap yourself until you feel like you've done enough and you've paid the price Jesus has already done it. It's the change of mind that is all it is. Because there was a man in the Bible, he was Judas, he was a follower, a disciple of Jesus, and he decided, you know, he was so frustrated because his mind was so logical, it lined up with what the world said, the the way that the world played the game, he understood those rules. This is why he got upset when Jesus was anointed, wasted all that perfume. Do you know how many thousands of dollars that perfume was? You just poured it and wasted it on Jesus. Jesus, we could have sold it. We could have given that money to the poor. It made sense to Judas. Jesus kept telling the disciples, I'm going to go. I'm going to die. He was going to die anyway. I might as well make some money. After he realized and it hit him that he had betrayed his friends his mentor, his spiritual father, his God, the Messiah, he betrayed him. Suddenly shame and sorrow, everything that you think repentance means or anything that you, all the emotions you think go along and piggyback off repentance. Judas had, and yet he still hadn't repented properly. Guess what? He was sorry for what he did. After he had done it, he went back and he tried to give the money back. He was sorry for what he did. He had changed his mind about what he did, yet he still ended up hanging from a cursed tree before Jesus did. And he hadn't truly repented. Repented has to be more than changing your mind. It is more than changing your mind. It is getting out of that mindset, realizing that shame uh, it has a place to play, play. It has a function. Shame does have a place to play. And I think we've grown up in a society, in a culture that would say you shouldn't be ashamed of anything you do. You should go out and shout about what you do. Be proud. Shout it loud. Tell the world. If anyone looks down upon you, it's on them, not you. Shame does have... Because you know what? If I'm cheating on my wife and I don't feel ashamed, I could tell you there's nothing wrong with shame. There's something wrong with me. That shame has its place. But the problem is we think that not only it it is a tool, it gets us from point A to point B. It should take us from our sin to repentance, from rebellion against God to obedience to God, and then it should go away. And do you know what else Jesus did on the cross? He smashed and he broke the power of that shame. If you are living in shame, if you are living in guilt, guess what? Jesus has paid the price and he has broken that. You just need to let go. You need to repent right now. That's what repentance is. To change your mind from the way that the world works, the rules of the game of the world, and line it up with what Christ is asking us to do, what Christ wants. Jesus changed the game, the effect of his coming. And he's given us the power, the strategy, the ability to see shame broken, to see our addictions broken. And I can tell you, if you get a a touch from Jesus this morning, don't walk out of here the same way. He wants to change your life. He wants that broken just as much as you do because he's looking for people who would become the heralds, those shouting in the wilderness, those preparing the way for the risen king so he could return back for his church. He wants those who would represent him beautifully. He wants a perfect and spotless bride. That's who he is looking for. Repentance, so simple, so simple, yet not always easy. This is all Gideon had to do. I'm the lowest of the low. All he had to do until the angel of the Lord showed up. It didn't change what his eyes saw. It didn't change his physical circumstance. It changed his mind. You're calling yourself the lowest of the low. You're living in shame. You're living, seeking sympathy, in denial of who you really are, in denial of your calling. And you know, some of us, that's a real addiction. We become addicted, addicted to shame. We become addicted to getting things done for us. 
because there's some work that needs to happen. I, I could tell you right now, in those days, to move those mountains, they didn't have diggers, they didn't have trucks, they didn't have backhoes, they didn't have some of those things, did they, Woody? Back then, they had shovels, they had horses. It took some work. It takes some work. But God is asking, repent. It's the gospel of John the Baptist, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the disciples. Gideon, you mighty man of valor, that re repented in his mind, changed, suddenly understood not just who he was. He didn't just line up with, with, with what the psychic hop line said. He made sure that his mind lined up with the thoughts and the will and the way of God. And then he was empowered to go ahead and defeat that enemy. It must be an aligning of truth, not the physical facts, but God's plan, God's understanding. <laughs> you know, I feel sorry, a young man, young man, old man, all men. If you've ever dated before, you know what it's like the first time in your relationship when you get given the, the silent treatment and you have no idea what you've done. <laughs> what have I done? I know she's angry at me. <laughs> I just really don't know what I've done. And we are so simple. We're simple creatures. We're just, just please tell me. Tell me so I can change it. Tell me so I can fix this. I want to change. I don't like living like this. Stop not talking to me. There are times when I wish you wouldn't talk to me, but just don't, right now. <laughs> I didn't understand it until now. When she says to me, um, you know, if you really cared, you would know what you've done. <laughs> And what I realise is, is, is she doesn't just want me to have the head knowledge of what I need to do next time, but to understand the, the thought process, the understanding of, of her mind, understanding her heart, understanding her desires behind it. And so we need to figure it out ourselves, and it's frustrating, it can be, but this is what repentance is. It's not just thinking differently. It's not just being sorry. It's not just being ashamed. It is moving our mind outside of the rules of the world out there and bringing it in alignment with Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 20 on your screen said, I had declared both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. There's theological debate about which comes first, the repentance or the faith. But yet I would say that the faith probably does because, again, it's not just turning your mind from something, but it's turning it to something. This is where Judas went wrong, is that he understood what he did. He was sorry for his mistake. He still did not put his trust in Jesus Christ. And he hanged himself too early. It is not just turning away from our sin, but turning back to Christ, turning back to God, turning back to his word in the power of his spirit. Jesus changed the game. There's an intrinsic link between faith and repentance, and we cannot have one without the other. Paul said to the Corinthians, Godly sorrow brings repentance. That leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Listen to that, no regret. You know what that is? That is getting rid of that shame. Getting rid of that shame. That's what godly sorrow does. Brings us to repentance, to change our ways, breaks the bondage of shame. You're not living in the past. Guess what? There's no scores on this game because it's a brand new game. Jesus has changed it. There is no, no past that you need to hold on to. He's saying it is a clean start. This is repentance. The effects of Christ. We don't hold on to our sin. We come in under the understanding of God. He changed the game through the gift of repentance. He also changed the game when he renewed our bloodline. He renewed our bloodline. This is beautiful. Verse 7 there says, But when he saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce, produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not think that you can say to yourselves, we're Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. That axe is already at the root of the tree. Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus came. He changed our bloodline. These were people hoping to be excused from God's wrath because of their blood. Because we were part of the Jewish people, expecting to, to escape the wrath of God simply because of their bloodline. 
And there are people here today hoping to be excused from the wrath of God simply because of the faith of our parents, simply because of our church attendance, simply because we give something in the tithes and offerings, simply because we serve every now and then. None of those things will save us from the wrath of God. These leaders had heard about this nutcase out in the wilderness preaching and baptizing people come to see what was happening. They, were, they genuinely believed in the coming Messiah and they didn't want to miss out. They wanted to be a part of what God was doing because God was going to bring along any man who would help them overtake their oppressors and regain what was taken from them, they thought. And so they thought they were safe being of the correct bloodline. They thought they were righteous, keeping the commandments. They acted all the right ways. They did what they were taught to do. They knew and belonged to the right crowd, the correct group of people. They were God's chosen people. Yet John came to them with a warning. The warnings, they they can become irritating. (laughs) Sometimes sitting in this place week after week, thinking, ah, getting poked, getting poked, getting poked. And sometimes it's frustrating in the presence of God getting poked and getting put and it seems like John you're being nasty you're not being very nice here can't you can't you be a little bit nicer these warnings they're not they're not they're not very pleasant not a great thing to be involved in but I can tell you right now that when the warnings are there it means that God is still interested and there is still time for that repentance to happen there's still time for you to change there is still time for you to get in the game that Jesus has created that Jesus is playing and be empowered by the Holy Spirit You think that warning is a bad thing? God is saying it is a blessing because there is nothing scarier than when those warnings stop. There is nothing scarier than when your heart becomes callous to what God is saying, when you get stuck in your sin and we're happy doing it and I know what it's like, I've been there. And you're looking for all the little things we can reach around this scripture in the Bible. Oh, I know God says this about this sin, but you know what? I can interpret it this way. When we begin thinking like that, our hearts become callous and we're missing the point completely. And as long as you were being poked and as long as you were being prodded, you better get on your knees and thank God. Thank you for still knocking on my heart. Holy Spirit, thank you for still stirring me up. Thank you for still believing in me. Thank you for still saying there's a chance. If he's prodding you right now, he's saying it, this is the time for salvation. This is the time for change. This is the time to see the effects of Christ coming. We can't live on our parents' faith anymore. You belong to a brood of snakes. They were a picture of the fruitless fig tree, that thing that looked okay from the distance. But guess what? Our bloodline doesn't mean anything to God. Our parents' faith won't do anything for us. Our church attendance, none of that stuff is going to do anything for us. And if you want to be saved from God's wrath, stop playing the games of the world and join His. These religious leaders try and attempting to use God to get what they wanted and were expecting. There's this great quote. You could put this quote up. Frederick Meyer, he was, I think he was, he was an evangelist around during the Welsh revival, and he had this to say. The Jewish leaders thought that the Messiah would come with judgment, but only against Israel's enemies. They were blind in their self-righteous confidence that only others needed to get right with God. And many today have the same idea. John the Baptist is sadly needed today. Much of what we call Christianity is but Christianized heathenism. We need that John the Baptist should come with his stern words about the axe, the winnowing fan, and the fire. Nothing less will avail to prepare the way for the new coming of Christ. These old school preachers, they just go for it. No political correctness back there. But there is a picture, the commentators would say, the axe lying at the base of the tree. It's this picture of the woodsman coming in. This tree had already been marked. It's going because it's not producing fruit. And so they would lay the axe down at the base, at the root of the tree, while they take off the outer garments so that they weren't restricted in swinging. That thing was coming down. This was the warning for them. There is... Plenty of us who get tired of the warnings, but God has not given up on us yet. It means there's still a chance. And those who think they come from a family or those who think they're not worthy or those of us still holding on to shame, God is saying, no, stop that. Jesus' blood was shed on that cross. It reset who we are. Suddenly, we're all children of God. He's saying, you put your faith in that man, that blood belongs to you. 
We now become children of God. We have his DNA. We are now in his bloodline. He has changed the game completely. Doesn't matter who your parents are. Doesn't matter where you were born, who you were born from. He's changed it completely. He has reset and he has started again. And he's saying, repent, repent and make way for the living Lord. I love it. You think you're so good because of your blood. God, God could raise up children from these rocks. <laughs> it's brilliant. It means nothing to him. It means nothing. Those things you were bragging about mean nothing to him. Come under the saving blood, the saving grace of Jesus Christ, and maybe you'll get his attention. Your past, your sin, your hurt, your addiction, your rebellion to him today is a new day. His mercy was new this morning. And the game is not lost. He wins. You now belong to God. He changed the game also with the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, he's changed the game. He's given us himself, his light, the word that is a lamp to our feet, the knowledge, everything we need, and the power of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me there comes a one who is more powerful than I. He said, I'm, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to carry. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And it's that Holy Spirit that made it all possible. In the Old Testament, we see not everyone got that access to the Holy Spirit. The King Saul, who had the Spirit on him, he didn't even realize when it had left. They didn't have it. We take it for granted, this access that we have that is so easy and has changed the game forever. That no matter who you are, and no, matter, no matter how long you've known God, that you could start again today. He wants to break those chains and he's given us the power to do it. He wants you to become a herald for him. He wants you to be making a way for the living God, to be just like his cousin John the Baptist. Jesus took 12 kids, fishermen, tax collectors, zealots. He used those who would come, who would stop everything and follow him. Would the musicians like to come? We're going to finish up soon. And I'm, I've been praying about God. How do you want this to finish? And I believe that God is saying, it's not too late. It's not too late. Again, he wants to touch you. He wants to touch you this morning because he wants to change you. And if there's something, anything within you, you feel the gnawing of the Holy Spirit, don't leave this place. Come down the front, worship, get prayed for, find someone after the service. I don't care what it is, but God is here in this place. He has promised us that he is here in this place. We are coming into the season, the Christmas season. If there's ever a time to prepare for the way, the way for the Lord, it's today. If there's ever a time to be able to bear witness to what Jesus Christ has done, it's today. This is good news. It's the gospel. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. It's so easy. It's so simple. It's so straightforward. And he has empowered us with the Holy Spirit to do it. These 12 young kids went out from that place. The Savior died. Very few people were there. All over the world, you could find these Christians because of these 12 young lads. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, who witnessed their Messiah die, but you know what? They also witnessed his resurrection. And they said, you know what? He's changed the game completely. The effect of his coming was that he changed the game completely. He has rigged this game, he has already won. The devil, it will be defeated. Sin and death have been defeated. The sting of sin has been defeated. The sting of death has been defeated. We are promised that we are adopted into his family. We have done nothing to deserve it other than understand what he has done. Put our faith and our trust completely in him. Repent from what we we're thinking. Repent from our selfishness. Repent from thinking our way was better and understand he's got something better for us. A promised eternity with him. No mourning, no pain, all because of the price he has paid. He has changed the game for you and I. If you realize that you haven't been walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, if you want to see what the power of the Holy Spirit could do, come and get prayed for. Let's pray for it. Let's see what happens. I don't know what's going to happen. Let's see what happens. But do you know what? If the Holy Spirit is available to me, I would rather be walking in that power than walking in my own strength any day of the week. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to, we're going to worship for a little bit first. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord.